Um, this will last for 12 weeks. The only exception to that will be the Wednesday night before Thanksgiving. We decided we would mark that off the schedule. So we finish, I think, the first Wednesday in December. I didn't look at the calendar, but I think that's how it works. Uh, it's a 12-week class. We will run consecutively for 12 weeks at 6.30 every Wednesday night, um, except Wednesday night, Thanksgiving Eve. That night we'll take off. Um, this will be uh, offered after the fact online. So if you are playing hooky one night and you get permission from the teacher, that's a joke. So if you can't make a night, uh, we'd like for you to stay up and to do that. And if I push all the right buttons, which I did about five minutes ago, it'll record it and we'll put it online hopefully tomorrow. Uh, there'll be a podcast for you or there'll be a DVD not a DVD, There'll be, it'll be online uh, video, online audio, and if you order, if you want a DVD, you would have to make a request, okay? Or CD, you'd have to make a request by putting it in that box in the back. There are hot dogs after the class tonight. For those of you who didn't have a chance to get a bite to eat, they're up in the fellowship hall, and uh, I think maybe the last ones are coming in. Please sign in. Please sign in. If your name is not on the sign-in sheet, maybe you didn't pre-register, that's fine. We don't care. Just sign in, and then uh, if your name's not on there, flip the sheet over and write your name on the back, and that'll work for tonight. So I think it would be altogether fitting and proper to pray as we launch this 12 weeks together. Um, let's do that. Father, uh, it is my heart's desire more than anything else, that this church would fall in love with your word. For your word is the revelation of who you are. And there's no way to separate your word from your son, and your son from your word. So, Father, tonight we seek you. We knock, we ask. And we believe that your word tells us, promises us, if we'll seek, we'll find. If we'll knock, the door will be open. If we ask, you'll answer you'll show us so tonight as we begin this journey together through the word of god through the scriptures intensely through the scriptures give us eyes that see ears that hear and a heart that will believe as we encounter you and walk with you in jesus name amen, amen. i have chosen dr david reagan's christ in prophecy study guide here's a copy of that it is an unusual study. Uh, it's not some preachy, teachy thing. It is a very scripture, 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 scripture. That's what it is. And I've gone through this now for uh, quite a few months and compiled a 12-week session out of it. Pretty much it's this. If I could summarize the 12 weeks, it's this. Jesus is revealed from Genesis to Revelation. And most people don't know it. And when you do know it, when you get it, you will never read the Bible the same again. It takes on a whole new life. Um, I'll get into that in a few minutes, uh, what that has meant to me personally and my ability to teach and my ability to preach. So with that said, um, Dr. David Reagan, this, this book uh, is extensive. This will be unlike anything I've ever done before, so I'm going to just say it up front. I have no idea how this is going to go. I mean, I'm not making that up. I have no idea. It's very non-typical for me to do what I'm about to do. And after the first session, you may be looking for one of those other rooms. <laughs> I don't know. In that study that I'm referring to, Dr. Reagan reviews the prophecies of the first coming. Many people call it the first advent. I don't know why they just don't say coming. Everybody would understand it then. He also reveals the, the second coming, the second advent. Tonight I will only briefly cover the Old Testament prophecies of Jesus' first coming. Tonight I will only 
briefly cover the Old Testament prophecies of Jesus' first coming. There's about 300 prophecies in the Old Testament that relate to the first time coming. However, many of those 300 are repeated over and over and over and over. We count them, but they're, they're the same thing over and over. Example is Jesus to be born from the seed of Abraham. There are, in the Old Testament, specific prophecies about the first coming of the Messiah. But there are also prophetic prophecies, prophetic types, symbolic prophecies. I'm not trying to confuse you. I'll, I'll explain in a minute. An example of this is Adam. The Apostle Paul calls Jesus the last Adam, using Adam as a symbolic prophecy. And when I say symbolic prophecy, it's like Adam becomes a preview a, a preview, a glimpse, a foreshadowing of the main event. I'll give you another example, Boaz in the story of Ruth. Boaz became a kinsman redeemer. Th this is so powerful in the Old Testament because when you get this, you'll start to read the Bible different. Boaz, and if you know nothing about the book of Ruth, you're probably not going to get what I'm about to say. But Boaz beca um, became a kinsman redeemer of Ruth. And what that means is Jesus, he's a preview, he's a prophetic preview of the coming of the Messiah. Jesus would be the ultimate kinsman redeemer, making Boaz a preview of the coming Messiah. So you think, why do I care? Boaz, a Jew, would take a Gentile bride and redeem her. Now, if you're a Gentile in this room tonight, you would want to stand up and say hallelujah. Because Boaz did what? He's a Jew who took a Gentile bride and redeemed her. What did Jesus do? He took a Gentile bride and he redeemed her. That's who's in this room tonight. Boaz becomes a picture of the coming of the Messiah in that way. Think about the examples of symbolic prophecies. Joshua in the Old Testament, Jeremiah, Daniel, they all give us insights about faith, courage, compassion. They all become these Old Testament patterns. But Old Testament patterns of whom? Are they just standalone Old Testament patterns or are they a revealing of Christ to come? Are they with their very life announcing the coming of the Messiah? I want you to start thinking like that. Um, it's interesting to me that Joshua and Jesus even have exactly the same name. In Hebrew, it is Yahshua. And the Old Testament language that was used is Hebrew. So today we say Joshua and we say Jesus. But in the Old Testament, it would be Yahshua and Yahshua. It would be the same word, the same name. Uh, so when Joshua becomes a preview of Jesus, what's more interesting is that he's got the same name in Hebrew pronounced as the angel told Mary and Joseph that you will name your son. Coincidence? Highly unlikely. Joshua is an English transliteration of a Hebrew name, Yeshua. And Jesus is a transliteration of the same name from the Greek. Abraham, for an example, offered his son Isaac on the altar. And by doing so, he became a preview of God's love that would offer Jesus on the cross of Calvary. What did God say to Abraham when he's got his knife over top of Isaac? Because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. What do you think that is? What's God going to do? He will not withhold from us his son, his only son. Abraham becomes a prophetic announcement of the coming Messiah. Did Abraham stand there and say, Jesus is coming? No. But did Abraham's life stand there and say, Jesus is coming. Yes. And when you start to read the Bible in this way, 
you'll start to see things you never saw. Suddenly you see Boaz taking the Gentile wife and redeeming her and think, that's the church. That's his announcement of what Jesus is going to do in the church age. There are also prophetic antitypes. Adam could be a preview of the Messiah in two forms. Jesus was going to be the second Adam or the last Adam, but Adam could also be a negative symbol or a negative preview of Christ. Example, Adam became a living soul. How does that reveal Jesus? Well, do a, an anti, do an opposite. Jesus became a life-giving spirit. Let me read 1 Corinthians 15, 45. The scriptures tell us the first man, Adam, became a living person. But the last Adam, that is Christ, is a life-giving spirit. So Adam becomes Adam. Are they the same? No. Adam becomes a, a, a living person, but the next time you find Adam, he will not be coming to make a living person like the first Adam, but he will become a life-giving spirit. Why? Because the first Adam finds his origin on earth. The second or the last Adam finds his origin where? On earth? Uh-uh. No, from heaven, from the Father. In first, Adam was of the earth. Jesus is from heaven. The next scripture, 1547. Adam, the first man, was made from the dust of the earth while Christ the second man came from heaven. Here's where I'm going. In this way, Adam, by his very being, is making a prophetic announcement by his life. He's announcing the next Adam. He doesn't know he's announcing, but his life is painting a picture of the next Adam that's coming. Adam rebelled against God. Jesus, an antitype, he obeyed God perfectly. Let me read Hebrews 5. Even though Jesus was God's son, I guess Adam was God's son, right? Who's Adam's daddy? I remember Audrey one time asking me, did Adam and Eve have belly buttons? So who's their daddy? So it's a good point, right? I want you to think like that. I want my kids to ask that question. So did Adam have a belly button? I can't imagine why, unless it's just so he didn't feel weird when he was swimming with the neighbors, so I don't know. Even though Jesus was God's son, he learned obedience from the things he suffered. In this way, God qualified him as a perfect high priest. He became the source of eternal salvation for all those who would, um, all those who would obey him. Adam rebelled, thus making a way for the next Adam to put back together the pieces that the first Adam had taken out of place. Through Adam, all were made sinners. Listen carefully. Deep spiritual truth. Through one man, through one man, Adam, everybody became a sinner. Why? You know, I can say that all day long, but until you understand why, you won't get it. Why did everybody become a sinner? Because Adam became a sinner. Because we all came from Adam. We all came from Adam. And because we all came from Adam, we all have a corrupted seed. We have a heart defect because our father, Adam, had a heart defect, and that was trans spiritually speaking. That was transferred to his offspring, right? So though through Adam, all were made sinners, but through Jesus, many were many, not all, OK? I need to say that. Many were made righteous and clean before God. How? Look at the next verse, Romans 5:19. Because one person disobeyed God. And that'd be Adam, right? Many became sinners. But because one person obeyed God, many were made righteous. Adam, what did he bring? He brought death. What did Jesus bring? He brought life. 
So it's this anti-type. Adam reveals the need for the second Adam. Hebrews 2.14. Because God's children are human beings. They are made of flesh and blood. Was Adam human? Yeah. Flesh and blood. Yes. The Son, that's reference to Jesus, also became flesh and blood. For only as a human could he die. Right? Right? Could, could, could he remain his heavenly form and die? No, he can't die. Only as a human could he die. And only by dying could he break the power of the devil. Who had the power of death. And by the way, what made Jesus, deep question, what made Jesus able to die anyway? Who's his mother? Mary, who's, so if I trace, Mary's human, right? Who's his father? It's not Joseph. So in one human package, in one human flesh, you have the Son of Man and the Son of God in one person. Now that's unique. But he was in human form so that he might be able and subject to death. Had he been only from his father, he's not subject to death. But because he is the son of man, by the way, he himself refers to himself, Jesus refers to himself as the son of man more than any other term in the scripture. When he's talking about himself, he says, and the son of man, and the son of man. Is he the son of God? Yeah, he's the son of God. He's the son of man. He's both. But how, look, look, because, uh, let me go back to verse 14. Because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die. And only by dying could he do something. What something? What made Adam die? Let me back up. When Adam was created in the garden before Satan, what was his life expectancy? Eternal. You think God created Adam and Eve originally to die? No. I'm not referring to his foreknowledge. I'm talking about his crafting of their human flesh. They would have been eternal flesh, right? They, they had the ability. In fact, what, was, what did God say? If you eat of this, you will surely die. I wonder at that point in the conversation, Adam says, what's that? They'd never seen that in their whole lifetime. They'd never seen They'd never seen death. They'd never experienced death. Nothing's ever died. Had animals died? No. Had trees died? Had vegetation died? Did anything die? Did anything float up to the top of the water? I guess not. Nothing died. It's a perfect creation, right? But one thing would bring death. But who brought the one thing? Don't leave him out. Who brought the one thing? His name's Satan. He's the serpent. He's the dragon. He brought that one thing. And only by dying could he break the power of the devil. Who, only by who dying? Only by Jesus dying. Could, could Adam dying break the power of Satan? No. What if there's a second Adam and he died? He could break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Verse 15. Only in this way could he set free all those who lived their lives as slave to the fear of dying. If you're in the room tonight and you're a slave to the fear of death, you're missing something about the gospel. You've been set free from this slavery to the fear of death. Adam lost dominion over the earth. Jesus won dominion over the earth. Hebrews 2.5 And furthermore, it is not the angels who will control the future world we're talking about. What future world? The one I'm looking forward to with great anticipation. Is it angels who are going to be in control? Negative. Who is? Believers. For in one place the scriptures say, what are people that you should think of them? Why is he so, why is he so good to people? Who are people that you would think of them or the son of man that you should care for him? Yet you made them a little lower than the angels and you crowned them with glory and honor. 
you gave them authority over all things now when it says all things it means nothing is left out who did he give authority over all things now let's start with man when god created adam put him on the earth what did he give him charge of everything it's yours who did adam hand it to let, let me put it like this i think this is the best way i've ever heard it described it's like adam was placed on the earth god breathed the breath of life into him and god handed him the title the title you know that thing you get when you buy a car the title it's yours the title says it's mine so god creates the earth gives adam the breath of life and gives him the title it's yours and here comes the snake who handed the title to the serpent god no who handed the title to the serpent adam so what will it take to get the title away from the serpent another adam pretty amazing when you think about it. what Adam did Jesus undid and what's Jesus going to do he'll have absolute dominion over the earth verse 8 you gave them authority over all things now when it says all things it means nothing is left out nothing but we have yet not yet seen all things put under their authority does it look like, okay, let me ask two questions. Does it look like everything's under our authority right now? No. Does it look like everything's under Jesus' authority on the earth right now? No. What did he say? But we have not yet seen all things put under their authority. Not yet, but it will be. When? When the last Adam comes. What we do see is Jesus, who was given a position a little lower than the angels. What does that mean? Can angels die? No. I'm convinced that an angel, in reference to this text, he, he was made a little lower than an angel. In this text, it's a reference to humans. He was made a little lower than is Jesus an angel? By the way, there are religions that believe Jesus is a promoted angel. That would be a blasphemy, in my opinion. He's not a promoted angel. He was made a little lower than the angels, and because he suffered death for us, which is not an issue particularly with angels, he is now crowned with glory and honor. Yes, by God's grace, Jesus tasted what I don't want to get in my mouth. He tasted death for everyone. So here's where we're going. We can see that the Old Testament has specific prophecies about the first coming, and they don't always look like somebody standing up and say, Messiah's coming, all right? They come in various forms. We also preview types of prophecies, but, but there are also ceremonial. This is where it gets really interesting to me ceremonial types of prophecies in the old testament the old testament tabernacle is one of the clearest clearest examples of a prophetic announcement by god in a symbol or in a well let's just take the tabernacle All right, let me let me set this up god calls israel out of bondage they're in egypt and they're going to be put into the wilderness and they're going to take them to the promised land. Before they go to the promised land, God's going to move into their neighborhood, right? God's going to actually, this just blows me away to even say it, God's going to move into the camp. But before he moves into the camp, he sets up some ground rules, right? He gives them the law. And the law tells the people how you're going to be able to live with God living in your neighborhood. That's what the law is. So what do they do? The first thing they do is they make a place for God to live. So they build this tabernacle. It's really just a tent with some pretty specific things. Only part of it was even covered, but it had things. And I want you to, here's the deal. Every Thing ordained by God through Moses in the tabernacle in the wilderness on the way to the promised land cries out Jesus Two th almost 2,000 years before he's born in Bethlehem 
Let me, let me show you. The gate. Now, I don't have time to go through all of the Old Testament announcements of the gate, but I'll tell you, how many gates were there to the tabernacle? One. No emergency exits in that building. One. All right? One gate. In John 10, 2,000 years later, I'm using rough numbers, obviously, Jesus comes and he says, yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely and will find good pastures. When you were a Jew on the outside of the tabernacle and you walk through the gate, what are you walking toward? What's in the gate? What's, what's in there? What's in the tabernacle? God. God's in there. How do you get to God? Through the gate. Church, how are you going to get to God? Through the gate. Is there another way to get to God? Can you climb over the fence? Good luck with that. There's only one gate. What about the altar? When you, if you look at the diagram, it's very specific in its order. When you walk into the Old Testament tabernacle, there would be an altar, a bronze altar. What did they do on the altar? They made animal sacrifices. Well, what do you mean? They, they, blood. Blood. They, they, they spilled the blood of the animal on the altar inside the tabernacle. Is, does that reveal Jesus? If there's only one gate, well, it's just a lucky break that that also, Jesus says he's a gate. Does Jesus say he's an altar? No, it's better than that. John 1, The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said what? Look, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Why did he call Jesus a lamb? Why? What do you think they put on the altar? Lambs. What do you think they did with the lambs on the altar? They killed them. Their blood flowed. And John the Baptist is filled with the Holy Spirit even before he's born. <laughs> Top that one, would you? Even before he's born, he's got the Holy Spirit. And he sees Jesus walking toward him at the Jordan River and says, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He's the altar. What's happening? Everything in the Old Testament tabernacle is crying out, Jesus, 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 Jesus. And when you start reading the Bible and seeing that, it opens up a whole new way of reading the Word of God. In fact, seeing the Word of God is totally different now. It's totally different. Let's go to the third one, the labor. The labor was where they washed. The priests had to wash themselves. It's water. It's a big water thing that they would pour water in and they would wash their instruments. They would wash their hands. The priests would wash themselves in the labor. What is Jesus the labor? John 1 33. I didn't know he was the one, but when God sent me to baptize with water, John the Baptist speaking, I didn't know he was the one, but when God sent me to baptize with water, he told me, the one whom you see the Spirit descend and rest is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. What was the idea of the labor? A washing away of the priest so that he would be able to move toward the holy place of God's presence. Can, can you, could you walk into the tabernacle and, and bypass the altar? Could you walk into the tabernacle and bypass the water? And let's just go straight on into the presence of the holy of holies and see God? No, you won't make it. And Jesus is, John the Baptist is revealing that, that God told me I was going to come to baptize, but he says the one who follows me, the one the Spirit comes on, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He's going to prepare you through water to move toward the presence of God. He's crying out, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. What about the showbread? By the way, Jesus also says what? I'm the living water. He says, whoever drinks this earthly water will thirst again. But whoever drinks the water that I give will never thirst again. In fact, it will become a well in you, springing up into eternal life. It's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Showbread. If you were to make it past the labor and past the altar and past the gate, you would get to the place where there would be a secondary curtain, and behind the secondary curtain would be a table of showbread. 
and the table of showbread, the priest would put bread out, 12 loaves representing the 12 tribes. And what, all of this is doing, listen, please don't miss this, all of this is taking you closer and closer and closer and closer and closer to what? That second curtain. What's behind the second curtain? God. Okay? You're getting closer and closer and closer, but you've got to go through these things to get. So if you want to, would you like to be a priest in the Old Testament and say, man, I'm really not into the whole water thing. And that altar is a mess. It gets your clothes all nasty. And you know what? If you'll go to the side and don't go through the gate and just pull up that curtain, you can get underneath the side and go straight into the holy place. Would anybody in the church say that today? You don't need any of that stuff. You don't need, we don't need the formality of the gate. We don't need the formality of the water. We don't need the formality of the blood. We don't need the format. Let's just go in to see the loving God behind the curtain. Sounds familiar to me. Jesus said, John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. The bread of what? Life. You're going to want that one day. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Can you, can you get to that second curtain without this bread? No. Finally, there's a lampstand. Not finally, but next to the last one. There's a lampstand. It is positioned before you reach the curtain that separates the most holy place. Je is Jesus a lampstand? By the way, when I was in Israel in 2010, one of the most amazing things to me even to this day is that that lampstand for the newly rebuilt Jerusalem temple is already made and it stands in the open in a glass case. I think it's a bulletproof glass case stands on a high place and the, if the western wall were that big wall the wailing wall were that big wall of the church it stands a little well it's further than maybe twice the distance from me to that wall in open view outside all the time it's ready to stand there and it's huge it's humongous i mean it's like this tall it's solid gold it is the lampstand that has already been made by the jews to go in the new temple Jesus in John 8, 12 says this. Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you'll have the light that leads to light. Can you, can you go and see God without the light? Without the water? Without the blood? Without the bread? Because, you know, here's the thing. Listen, listen, I'm, I'm not trying to talk about water. I'm not talking about bread. I'm not even talking about a candle stand. I'm talking about what every one of those are. All of those are revelation of a man named Jesus. Can you go to the Father without him? You won't make it. You won't make, nobody will make it. The incense. The last thing you'll find in the Jerusalem tabernacle, not in the wilderness tabernacle, Actually, it would have been carried through to the Jerusalem temple, by the way. But the last thing you'll find will be this, all, this incense, where they would burn the incense, and it would create an aroma. It was a symbol of the prayers of mankind seeking the presence of God. Do you need prayer? Is Jesus revealed in the incense? Romans 8.34 who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us, and he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand right now today in the church age doing what? Pleading for us. You know what he is? He is the voice that opens the way between into the holy place of God's presence. Pleading for us. He's pleading for me. This one's with me. He's pleading with me. He is the altar of incense. He is the prayers, not of people, even though that's representative of people's prayers. He's the ultimate prayer to the Father. Now, once you go through all of those, there is a second curtain. It's called a veil. What's behind that? 
Well, let's just deal first with the veil. Matthew 27, verse 50. Then Jesus shouted out again and he released his spirit. He's on the cross, right? And at that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split apart. As Jesus was dying, as he was giving up his life's breath on the cross, as he was becoming literally the, sec the last Adam, the earth starts shaking and the veil that separates the holy place, the presence of God, from, out, from, the, from the next compartment is torn from the top to the bottom. Why? Coincidence that it's happened at that very moment or a great spiritual significance? What is the veil? It, it separates man from God. So what was Jesus doing on the cross? Removing the barrier that kept man from the presence of God. How? By the sacrifice of his own body. He, met, he, he opened the curtain. He opened the curtain. There's a high priest. Could anybody go into the Jerusalem, excuse me, into the wilderness tabernacle? Could any, anybody? No, you had to be a priest. You had to be a high priest. You could only go in there once a year. It's called Yom Kippur. They still practice that, by the way, today, except there's no temple. It's called the Holy Day of Atonement. And on, when the tabernacle and when the temple were in place, the high priest would have to go through the water, through the blood, through, the, through all of the various symbols, and he would take blood and he would go through the curtain one day a year, only one day a year, only one day a year could he do it. He would go into the holy place, the curtain would open, he would walk in with blood, sprinkle the blood. Only the high priest is that high priest announcing Jesus. Yes. I'll say it again. Everything in the tabernacle is revealing Jesus. Go to Hebrews. Again, almost 2,000 years after the high priesthood was even established. It says this, For Christ did not enter into a holy place made with human hands, which was only a copy of the true one in heaven. He entered into heaven itself to appear now before God on our behalf. Jesus is my high priest. He stands in the presence of God. He goes in ahead of me, ahead of you, giving us access to the Father. Now, this is when the Bible took on a totally different power in my life. I realized that everything in the Old Testament was crying out Jesus. Everything became different. When I would teach a class, when I would preach a sermon, some of you may have noticed by now that when I teach or when I preach or when I do anything, I connect the dots. Why? Because when I started to realize that everything in the Bible cries out Jesus, then suddenly I had, because of God's grace, the ability to connect the dots. I've been connecting dots now for 20 minutes. Connecting dots starts to reveal that God's Word is God's Son, and God's Son is God's Word. They are the same. They are the same. So if you're in the room and you say, I'm really into Jesus, so I'm not into God's Word, I politely say, you have no clue what you're talking about. You can't separate them. They are the same. Think about the contents of the Ark of the Covenant. Probably one of my favorite parts of the story tonight. Once the high priest got into that room and he was bringing blood, he would see a gold chest. It had poles that the, the appropriate people only could carry that chest with. But what is that chest? Because if you miss the chest, carrying it's irrelevant. What is it? What is that golden chest? We call it the Ark of the Covenant. You saw the Indiana Jones movies, right? Everybody wants that thing, right? What is it? Let's call it what it is. It is the throne of God. Where was it eventually placed? In Jerusalem. Where in Jerusalem? In the holy place. Where is the holy place in Jerusalem? the Temple Mount. Where's the throne of God today? Well, there's a throne of God in heaven. Where's the throne of God going to be? In Jerusalem. 
on the Temple Mount. He's announced it. So I have a question. What was inside that box of gold? It's traveling through the wilderness for generations until it makes its way to Jerusalem and David brings it into the city. Solomon builds a temple. And then when Solomon builds the temple, it will find its permanent home behind the curtain. But what's in the box? What's in the box? Think about the Ark of the Covenant, which was the throne of God behind the curtain. The Ark would be made of wood which would be a symbol that the Messiah would be a man. Now, that would, might go over your head when I first say it. The ark would be made of wood, which would be a symbol that the Messiah would be a man. Why? The wood comes from where? where? Heaven? Trees come from heaven. Trees come from the earth. The Messiah will come from the earth. But what's the wood covered with? God described to Moses how to build the ark. Moses didn't get down with a bunch of dudes one day and say, let's build a box. God gave him the diagram. The ark would be covered with gold, which would be a symbol that the Messiah would come from man, but he would be divine, covered with gold. Wood overlaid with gold. The ark contained three objects, first of which was the stone tablets. And we know what? I hope you know by now, Jesus is the Word. Those stone tablets inside that throne represent the Word of God. Do the stone tablets cry out, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus? Yes, they do. The ark also contained a jar of manna. Does the jar of manna cry out, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus? What is the jar of manna? Bread. What's manna? Bread. What's Jesus? He's the bread of life. The third thing is Adam's, or Aaron, not Adam, Aaron's staff. And Aaron's staff, if you don't know the story, Aaron's staff, he threw it on the ground and it, it, it budded. He placed it along other people so that God would prove who his priest actually was. And, and Aaron's staff, it's a stick, okay? It's a walking stick. But God made that staff bud and produce almonds. A stick budded out and produced almonds. We know that Jesus came back to life. What? Jesus was buried in the earth. He came back to life. And he produced fruit. And he produced people that would produce fruit. Does Aaron's staff cry out, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Yes, the lid of the ark was called the mercy seat. And the mercy seat would sprinkle blood on it once per year to atone for the sins of the people. We know that Jesus would be the final blood sacrifice of the sins of man. Can you see it? Everything in the Old Testament cries out, Jesus. Now, I want to read something from Robert Jeffress book, Countdown to the Apocalypse, in light of tonight's opening session. In the Old Testament, there are over 1,800 references to the return of Christ. Of the 260 chapters in the New Testament, there are more than 300 references to the return of Christ, one out of every 30 verses. 23 of the 27 New Testament books give prominence to the subject of Jesus' return. For every prophecy in Scripture concerning the first coming of Jesus Christ, there are eight that talk about the second coming. And people tell me I talk too much about Jesus' return. I'm only talking about Jesus' return in proportion to what the Scripture talks about Jesus' return. One final view of Old Testament prophecy, historical types. Think about the Passover from Egypt. It, does it cry out, Jesus? A lamb would stop the death that was coming, right? If you're in Passover Egypt, you're in Egypt, God's told what? You've got to take a blood of a lamb, put it over your house, because death's coming. Does the Passover in Egypt cry out, Jesus? Yes. What about the bronze serpent in the wilderness? Now, I recognize that's probably not as popular a story as the Passover. Let me read Numbers 21. 
Then the people of Israel set out from Mount, Mount Hor, taking the road to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people grew impatient with a long journey. Now, 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 let me tell you something. They're going through the wilderness. If you, let me set it up like this. Do you know right now, church, you're in the wilderness on your way to the promised land? Have you all ever grown impatient while you're in the wilderness? I have. I'd like to go to the promised land. I'd like to stop this wilderness wandering business and let's just move on to the promised land as a group. Let's just move on to the promised land. So with that said, but the people grew impatient with the long journey and they began to speak against God and Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die here in the wilderness? They complained. Why did you bring us out of Egypt? What was Egypt? Uh, slavery? Bondage? Right? Why did you bring us out of Egypt? There's nothing to eat here, nothing to drink, and we hate what? This horrible manna. Church, church, what is the manna? The bread of life, right? It's angel food. You hate angel food? Right? Church, church, listen. We're in the wilderness right now. Jesus is the bread of life. He's enough. He sustains us while we're in the wilderness. We're on the way to the promised land. This is not just some funny story. Right now, we are representing this story. We are in the wilderness. We've been removed from Egypt. We're on the way to the promised land. And all we've got is the bread of life. And people are whining. What? Why are you whining? You want to go back to Egypt? Yeah, there was good stuff there. I'm sick of this manna. What? Do you know what the manna is? If the Bible is prophecy in every word, do you know what the manna is? It's Jesus. You're already tired of Jesus? Church, you're already tired of Jesus? No, I'm not tired of Jesus. I'm tired of the wilderness. Well, I'm tired of the wilderness too. But you know what he gave us while we were in the wilderness? Jesus. Let me keep going. That'll preach too, by the way. So the Lord sent poisonous snakes among the people, and many were bitten. Why did he send snakes? Because they complained about the manna. <gasps> did they know what they were saying? What's the manna? The bread of life. So he's going to send them some snakes. And many were bitten and died. Then the people came to Moses and cried out, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord. Right? They're finally getting it, aren't they? By speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take away the snakes. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord told him, Make a replica of the poisonous snake, attach it to the pole, and all who are bitten will live if they simply look at it. Oh, interesting. So Moses made a snake out of bronze and attached it to the pole. Then anyone who was bitten by a snake could look at the bronze snake, and the snake bite would be healed. First, let me say that Moses was a preview of the Messiah. Moses himself, by standing there as the deliverer out of Egypt, is a preview of Jesus. Moses' life cries out, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Poisonous snakes are biting people. People are dying. A picture of Satan and the death that Satan brought to man. A bronze serpent was placed on a pole and raised up for all to see. A picture of the cross. And, let me add to it, a picture of the spiritual war that is raging in the heavenly realms between God and the serpent and the dragon. And one day, Jesus is going to stomp his head. And the bronze and serpents are both biblical symbols of sin. Jesus took the sins of mankind upon himself on the cross, and by doing so, he brought life to those who would look up to him. You could look up to him and the snake won't be able to kill you. The dragon won't be able to reach you because you looked up at him. Jesus. Now, if, is that story calling out a prophetic cry, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus? Well, let's ask Jesus. Don't ask me, let's ask him. In John 3, 14, Jesus quotes this story. 
Jesus says, as, And as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. Jesus quotes the story, announcing his own death on the cross. What about the water of the Red Sea? What about the water of the Jordan River? You might catch an on by now. If you catch an on by now, raise your hand. Everything in this book cries out the same thing. Jesus. The children of Israel passed through the water of the Red Sea when they left their slavery in Egypt, right? Accident? You think he, there was another way? I saw the map. There's another way. He wanted them to go through the sea. The children of Israel... So the first time out, Moses is leading them what? And they pass through the Red Sea. Forty years later, after they rebelled in the wilderness, they pass through the floodwaters of the Jordan River into the Promised Land after their wilderness testing. Right? We have two scenes of Israel passing through water. One's the Red Sea. Forty years later, it's the Jordan River. Right? Jesus went into the waters of baptism in the same Jordan River. And then he entered the wilderness for the time of testing. It's like he did the opposite. He crossed the Jordan for the testing. They crossed the Jordan for the deliverance. Can you see it? Everything. Even the water of Noah's flood. Even the water of Noah's flood cries out Jesus and the baptism of Christ. Let me read it. And by the way, it's written in the New Testament. In the letter of Peter. Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring them safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the spirit. So he went to preach to saint, the spirits in prison. Those who disobeyed God long ago when God waited patiently while Noah was building his boat. Only eight people were saved from drowning in that terrible flood. And that water, what flood? The, what water? The flood water of Noah. That water is a picture of what? Baptism. Which now saves you by the removing dirt from your body. Not, not by removing dirt from your body, but as a response to God from a clean conscience. It is effective because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, Christ has gone into heaven. He is seated in a place of honor next to God. And all the angels and authorities and powers accept, accept his authority. Everything, everything cries out Jesus. So here's, uh, let me turn a corner and we'll wrap this up tonight. Why do you think we have the Bible, the words of God today? So that we might know him and know how to come to the saving knowledge of Christ and faith through him. This might be the best way to sum up the first session of biblical prophecy tonight. And the reason there is biblical prophecy revealing itself. 1 Corinthians 10.1, listen carefully. I don't want you to forget. Why do you have the Bible? I don't want you to forget. Dear brothers and sisters, about our ancestors in the wilderness long ago, all of them were guided by a cloud that moved ahead of them, and all of them walked through the sea on dry ground. In the cloud and in the sea, all of them were baptized as followers of Moses. Did he all see all of them, all of them, all of them? Anybody catching this? All of them went through the water. All of them did the same thing. Are all of them going to make it? Nope. All of them ate the same spiritual food. All of them drank the same spiritual water. For they drank from the spiritual rock that traveled with them. That rock was Christ. Well, that's 1,500 years before he was born. Well, that rock is Christ. Yet God was not pleased with most of them, and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Here it comes, here it comes. These things happened as a warning to us so that we would not crave evil things as they did. Why do you have the scriptures today? These things were written. They happened as warnings to us so that we wouldn't do what they did. Or worship idols, as some of them did. As the scriptures say, the people celebrated with feasting and drinking, and they indulged in pagan revelry. And we must not engage in sexual immorality, as some of them did, causing 23,000 of them to die in one day. 
Nor should we put Christ to the test as some of them did and they died with snake bites. And don't grumble. Oh my goodness, this would take out the bunch of people. And don't grumble as some of them did and they were destroyed by the angel of death. These things happened to them as examples for us. They were written down to warn us who live at the end of the age. Is that clear? If you think you're standing strong, be careful not to fall. The temptations in your life are no different from, the, from what others experience, and God is faithful. He will not allow, you, allow the temptation to be more than you can stand, but when you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. There are 109 specific prophecies in the Old Testament announcing the first coming of Jesus that are written down as being fulfilled in the New Testament. You want to convert a Jew who doesn't believe in Jesus as Messiah? Show him all 109 of them. It works. It really does. I've seen evidence of that. I will list only a few to finish tonight. Jesus is from the Shemite branch of mankind. Noah had three sons. Ham. I keep wanting to say Sam. Ham, Sam, and another guy. Ham, Shem, and they, okay. He had three boys. <laughs> I just had a brain quit. Genesis 9, 26. Here's the prophecy. Then Noah said, may the Lord, the God of Shem, be blessed, and may Canaan be his servant. Here's the prophecy, okay? What's the fulfillment of the prophecy? Go to the Gospel of Luke in the genealogy of Christ. Shelah was the son of Canaan. Canaan, the son of Arphaxed. All right, yeah, that guy. And Arphaxed was the son of Shem. Shem was the son of Noah. Noah was the son of Lamech. What was prophesied in Genesis 9, that the Messiah would come from the tree of Shem, is fulfilled in the Gospel of Luke in the genealogy of Christ. By the way, the word Shem is where the word Sem, Semite, comes from. So when you hear someone say they are an anti-Semite, it means they hate the Jewish people because the Jewish people come from Shem, one of the sons of Noah. Jesus will come from the family of Jacob. You know how I know? It was prophesied. Let me read to you the prophecy. Genesis 28. This is when Jacob is sitting in the ladder, goes up and down to heaven, Jacob's ladder. At the top of the stairway stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your grandfather Abraham, the God of your father Isaac. The ground you are lying on belongs to you. I am giving it to you and to your descendants. Your descendants will be as numerous as the dust of the earth. They will spread out in all directions, to the west, to the east, to the north, and to the south. And all the families of the earth will be blessed through you and your descendants. Did that happen? Was that fulfilled? Okay, go to the Gospel of Luke. Judah was the son of Jacob. Jacob was the son of Isaac. Isaac was the son of Abraham. Abraham was the son of Terah. Terah was the son of Nahor. Everything that was prophesied to Jacob's latter event was fulfilled and recorded in the Gospel of Luke. Coincidence? Jesus the Messiah will come from the tribe of Judah. How do we know that? It was prophesied in Genesis 49, 2,000 years before Jesus was born. Here's, here it comes. Judah, your brothers, will praise you. You will grasp your enemies by the neck. All your relatives will bow before you. Judah, my son, is a young lion that has finished eating its prey. Like a lion, he crouches and he lies down like a lioness who dares to rouse him. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from his descendants, until the coming of the one to whom it belongs, the one whom all nations will honor. That's in Genesis 49. They're already talking about the coming of Jesus in Genesis 49. You know, that's 2,000 years before he arrived. Was it fulfilled? Go to Romans chapter 5. But one of the 24 elders said to me, Revelation, not Romans, Revelation 5. 
One of the elders, 24 elders said to me, stop weeping. Look, the lion from the tribe of Judah, the heir to David's throne has won the victory. He is worthy to open the scroll and its seven seals. He's called a lion from the tribe of Judah because in Genesis he's called a lion from the tribe of Judah. One more. Jeremiah 23. He is, he, the Messiah, will come from the house of David. For the time is coming, the Old Testament prophet Jeremiah says, from the time is coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up a righteous descendant from King David's line. He will be a king who rules with wisdom. He will do what is just and right throughout the land. Was it fulfilled? Luke chapter 1. Confused and disturbed, that'd be Mary. Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He'll be very great and be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Now, now some of you would say, well, you know, that hasn't actually been fulfilled. It just had an intermediate angelic confirmation but it will be fulfilled. The conclusion, Revelation 22. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this message for the churches. I am both the source of David and the heir to his throne. I am the bright and morning star. How can he be the source of David and the heir of David in the same person? That means he's before David and he's after David. Do you see it? This 12, week will re- 12 weeks will reveal one thing. Everything in the scripture cries out, Jesus. And you have the scriptures for a reason, as a warning that we do not do what they did. Father, thank you for this journey. Thank you for your word. Thank you for eyes and ears that hear and see and made the Spirit revealed to the churches so that we might understand. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all for being here tonight.